raw milk is not pasteurized or homogenized. And pasteurization and homogenization are two different things. Pasteurization is like where you heat the milk up for about two seconds to eliminate any like bad bacteria that may be in there or something like that. It makes the product more safe. It's essentially like cooking your steak. That is what you're doing. Homogenization is a little bit different. It's where they actually like break up the components of milk so that the cream doesn't settle on top. So if you've ever had non-homogenized milk, the cream settles on top and you've got to shake the milk before you drink it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with heavy cream on top and skimmed milk on the bottom, right? Like you're, it's going to be two different types of milk. Hello, my friend. We are back again with another episode. I'm so glad that you're joining me today. Now, there are three people in this recording. You're going to hear three voices. We don't get to do this too often. Super fun. Um, So you're going to hear from Tara and Natalie. They are the hosts of the Discover AG podcast. So If you love our conversation today, and I think you're going to, I was really pleasantly surprised with where our conversation ended. And I was really happy. Kind of the highlight for me is oftentimes, and I hear this a lot with the Keto Diet Podcast and just overall health stuff, is when we walk away from podcast episodes about health, sometimes you feel like, great, I have to like, I have to overdo, I have to overhaul my life. That there's so many things I'm doing wrong and how am I going to afford all of this? And we talked about this recently, actually on the show, um, a listener by the name of Amber sent me this heartfelt message a while back and just said like, I can't afford anything and this is stressing me out. So episode 438, which launched September 12th, 2023, it's labeled health on a $0 budget, like actually zero. We talk about some of the aspects of like how to care for your family when you don't have a budget. And Tara and Natalie and I all kind of talked from different points of view in this topic of why it's important to understand agriculture, why it's important to understand where our food comes from so we can make educated decisions. Because a lot of the labeling is just trying to get our attention and trying to get us to pay more for stuff we don't need? And do we really need these things? And what's important to you? And what are your goals with your health? Do you need XYZ items? We really go through a lot of these things together from very different viewpoints. I know for myself personally, from as far back as I can remember, I made the decision to eat as clean as possible when it came to animal products. And so myself personally, I've chosen not to do a lot of just standard meats. And that means that I don't drive a nice car. If you've followed me over the last 15 years sharing on social media, you know, my cars are literally the worst, but it means that I don't have car payments and I can spend money on other things, including grass finished beef and all of those things. And that's important to me. But what Natalie and Tara were bringing up is like, that might not be important to you. You might have other things that are of importance and you're totally stressing over things that don't actually matter to you. So such a great conversation. So Natalie and Tara are the co-hosts of the Discover AG docu-series, as well as the popular podcast Discover AG. Collectively, they have been advocating for agriculture online and on various social media platforms for over 10 years. Together, they have fostered a community of over 250,000 individuals, spoken on stages across the nation and globe, and empowered a community to reconnect the agricultural industry and the hands that feed us. So I kind of spoiled it already. We're talking a lot about how to just feed your family and prioritize things. When you have information, you're empowered to make decisions. So we're talking about agriculture and understanding what this means and the biggest issues facing them, the myths and misconceptions around how animals are fed to different byproducts and what labeling means and how to be informed as a consumer so you can make the proper decisions for yourself. So I hope that you are empowered through this conversation. I hope it encourages you. And again, if you love this conversation and you want to delve deeper with Tara And Natalie, the best place to go is podpage.com slash discover dash AG, or just go to your Google machine and type in discover AG podcast and a bunch of stuff will pop up. So let's get over to our conversation with Tara and Natalie. Hey, my name is Leanne Vogel. I'm fascinated with helping women navigate how to eat, move and care for their bodies using a low carb diet. 
I'm a small town holistic nutritionist turned three-time international best-selling author turned functional medicine practitioner offering telemedicine services around the globe to women looking to better their health and stop second-guessing themselves. I'm here to teach you how to wade through the wellness noise to get to the good stuff that'll help you achieve your goals. We're supporting your low-carb life beyond the if-it-fits-your-macros conversation. Hormones, emotions, relationship to your body, workouts, letdowns, motivation, blood work, detoxing, metabolism. I'm providing the tools to put your motivation into action. Think of it like quality time with your bestie mixed with a little med school so you're empowered at your next doctor visit. Get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn about your body and how to care for it better. This is the Keto Diet Podcast. Hey ladies, how's it going today? Hi, it's going good. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, we're very excited to be here. Yes, it's been a hot minute since I've got to hang out with two individuals at the same time. I'm so excited to have this conversation today about agriculture. We set up the tone in the intro I just shared with everybody, but can you tell us in a few words how you got started into this and what lights both of you up? Yeah, so I'll go first. So I am Tara. I'm a dairy farmer from New Mexico. I'm actually a fifth generation dairy farmer. But I got my degree in environmental science. And so my path maybe looks a little bit different than maybe like a conventional dairy farmer. My husband dairy farms with his family and several of his brothers. And I, you know, have done this my entire life and then ultimately started sharing online and telling our story. And that is where I met Natalie and where we kind of came together for our passion of being able to share about agriculture through our podcast. Yeah. So like Tara, I also grew up in agriculture. I grew up on a cattle ranch. I grew up in Southwest Montana. So for a lot of listeners, they immediately think of Yellowstone. (laughs) And we won't even start down the path of whether, you know, that is a real life depiction or not. But wonderful childhood. And like Tara, I also diverged from the path of agriculture a little bit. I actually got my degree in pharmacy. And I was practicing as a full-time pharmacist in a, you know, bigger, quote unquote, city in Montana. And I really kind of thought that would be my path. You know, I was very passionate about the work I was doing. And I lived near the ranch I grew up on with my family. So I spent a lot of time out there, but I, you know, wasn't living on it. My income wasn't derived from it. And I certainly wasn't, you know, sharing about agriculture on social media. So to be kind of in this seat now talking about things with Tara and having our podcast is it's very rewarding and fulfilling because both Tara and I will say that we're very passionate about this industry. And we love, you know, connecting people who, you know, aren't as familiar with, you know, the people who are growing the food and how it's grown. But it was just never anything I saw coming. I fell back in agriculture when I married my husband. He was a rancher in Nebraska. That's how I ended up where we are now. So we ranch in Central Nebraska. And I also, like growing up, I raise beef cattle now. Amazing. And you both spoke of your unique ability to see things differently. What is the one thing, like if somebody is listening that's maybe like agriculture, why do I care about this conversation? What's like the one thing that you hear time and time again, or even that fuels the work that you both do that you feel is so integral to an individual living on this planet to understand agriculture? Yeah. So I think, you know, at the basis, we all consume food, you know, three times a day, and yet we know very little about it. And I even think Natalie and I can speak to that. You know, we know about our individual, like we know about dairy farming and know about cattle ranching, but, you know, we have toured, we just, this summer we went to a sheep ranch where they were producing wool and we, it was a whole new world for us. And so, you know, for everyone, like there's just so much to agriculture. And so one of Natalie and I's, I think what we try to do and what we try to bring to our listeners and our audience is a unique perspective to agriculture. You know, we're both millennial women in ag and try to make ag really relatable so that people, you know, are excited about it. We have our tagline is kind of like make ag cool again, that, you know, people are excited about learning where their food comes from. You know, and Tara touched on eating three times a day. And that's obviously very important. And that is, I think there's like two sides of food. And for me, that is obviously, you know, like, I don't know, the simplest form of it, right? Like we put food in our bodies because we need it three times a day. We need it for survival. On the flip side of coin, there's like a whole emotional side to food, right? Like when you think about sitting down, like preparing food, connecting like the, the emotions that go into food and how truly personal food can be for people, like sometimes it's connected to their heritage and sometimes you know, it's connected to memories. And I think that's missing from our society that when we have something that that is so emotional to us, but kind of like Tara said, you have that missing piece of the kind of the information behind it. 
I just love to see that closed loop so that for people who are passionate about food and do care about it beyond the, you know, like feeding myself to survive, I love tying them to that, the family behind it and how it was raised and just kind of making them feel more connected to it in the the way they probably crave and want to be. Yes, completely. So it sounds like there's a little bit of getting people interested in agriculture and starting to ask questions around where their food comes from, maybe even where their clothing is coming from, like just all the things like what you're talking about, Tara, the wool, and just, wow, I didn't even think about the processing of our clothes or materials beyond what we're eating. What do you find is like the biggest issue. Now this might be biting off a huge chunk, but what do you find is the biggest issue in agriculture today that maybe people are already talking about, or perhaps there's misconceptions around? So I can start, you know, I think that is a huge topic, but I guess a piece of it is, you know, we see kind of like a clip online or a headline or something, and we don't always get all the whole story. And a lot of times we don't get any of the story from the actual like farmers or ranchers that are out there like boots on the ground that are doing this work. And so I think that is a piece. I feel like when people connect on a people to people level, there is just such a better you know stream of communication. And that's something that like Natalie and I really try to work towards is like being that communication, like being able to you know, open up our farms and ranches to people that have questions. You know, in this day and age, I feel like we are in a place that people are more like food curious, I guess, than they've ever been or even curious about, you know, we see a lot about fast fashion and what's going on with producing our clothes. And people leave with more questions than maybe answers. And so by being able to actually go to the source, you can actually have a real conversation and get the answers you're looking for and, you know, feel that connection again to kind of like your roots and where it all starts from. Completely. And so I think this ties really nicely into just maybe talking about myths and misconceptions that we hear. I know a really big thing and has been going on for quite some time is the role of the carbon footprint to talking about cattle and how it's safer for the environment and healthier for us and just healthy overall for us to all be consuming a plant-based diet understanding agriculture probably better than most of us. What are some of the thoughts you have surrounding that whole story? Yeah. So one of the first things we'll say, and you'll hear us say it a lot on our podcast, is that like every food is going to have footprint, right? It has an impact. So, I mean, that's what we're doing when we're farming, ranching. All of that is, you know, we're taking a resource and then fortunately we're extracting it, right? For all of our use and consumption. So our role as farmers and ranchers is to really minimize that impact. Lots of times that's where you'll hear the word like sustainable or regenerative come into play because instead of just extracting, our role is to then, you know, put back, maintain, create further, nourish. So I think that's really important to think about is that every single food you eat, you know, when you're going to the grocery store, you're not unfortunately going to be able to buy something that didn't come at a cost, right? That didn't extract from some form, whether it's, you know, labor, you know, human rights, like land usage, like all of those things. And so big picture, it's like, there's not a perfect option where you're like, yay, I checked all the boxes. And I didn't have a footprint. And so now I am doing, you know, better than everyone else. When it comes to like narrowing down on the scope, as far as you know, your question about plants versus animals, you know, Tara and I talk a lot about regenerative agriculture, we get asked a lot about it. My ranch is a really great example of this. We border what's known as the Nebraska Sandhills. It is a really, really beautiful, very large part of our state, actually, that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. But it is an intact, you know, it's actually the world's largest intact grasslands ecosystem still. And it is thriving, and it is biodiverse, and it is maintained because of cattle grazing on it. So ruminants, which are cattle are, play a really, really important role when it comes to soil health and maintaining grasslands and increasing biodiversity and doing a ton of really awesome things that can be traced all the way back to when like buffalo roamed our earth. So we actually, you know, advocate for, you know, animals out grazing, we advocate for animals being a part of the ecosystem. And there's a ton of facts and stats we can get into. But I think big picture, animals are really villainized, and they actually play a pretty awesome and important role when it comes to our food. On that note, I think that a lot of our society, when we have these conversations about climate, we've gotten like carbon tunnel vision, where the only thing we see is the carbon footprint. And in reality, it is such a more complex system than that. You know, Natalie mentioned like cattle grazing, like you've got to take into account soil health. You've got to take into account all the different pieces. You know, I'm on a dairy farm, so our cattle are not out grazing. 
but like the products they're consuming within their diet are maybe byproducts from something else we're doing, like producing cotton or producing ethanol. And so all of these pieces have to be taken into account instead of just like, quote unquote, here's your carbon footprint, like period, end of conversation. Like, it's just not that black and white. There's a lot more nuance to the conversation of ecosystems and our food system and how they all work together to create, you know, the system that we know it as it is today. Yes, I went down the rabbit hole of global warming the other day and started researching the temperatures in grasslands versus cities and really starting to dig deep into maybe perhaps the reason why we're seeing such an instrument like increase in temperatures has to do with how much cement we just have sitting around and how much the less grasses we have, the less natural resources and spaces, these big spaces we used to have, the more heat we are going to create as a planet. And so I found that really interesting of just thinking outside the box, like what you're saying of how can we look at this in a different way? Now, there was something that Tara said, byproducts. Can we get into that for listeners that kind of maybe caught that? And they were like, what do you mean byproducts, canola? Can we get into that a little bit further? Yeah, this is like one of my favorite topics because we talk a lot about the benefits of grazing animals. But then, you know, I'm on the flip side where my animals are in like a pen, a big corral. And so one of the really cool things about dairy cattle is that they do, and all cattle across the spectrum, consume a lot of what we call byproducts. And I hate that word because it makes it sound like it's like, trash or not great, but it's actually really great quality things. It's just left over from doing other things. And it really depends on where you're at in the country. So I'm in kind of cotton country. And when you produce cotton, you end up with a cotton seed. And it is not a lot of value to people and obviously can't be used in, you know, clothing. That's not what we're using out of the cotton. And so we actually feed our cattle cotton seed. And it's a big piece of their protein that they get in their diet. And otherwise, a lot of these products, whether it's cotton seed or, you know, if you're in Florida, citrus pulp, a lot of like if you're making orange juice and you're removing the pulp, what happens to all of that pulp? It can be fed to dairy cattle. And that you can think about that in all sorts of forms across our food of what's left over when we make our products, you know, from ethanol to distillers grains to just everything. Cattle can consume those byproducts. And so it's really cool and really local to where you're at as far as what your cattle are consuming. But the big stat there is actually if we stopped feeding all of those byproducts to cattle and we were to, say, compost them instead, which is really a best case scenario, I don't know that that would actually happen, you would increase emissions from those products by five times. If they ended up in a landfill instead, which is the most likely scenario because we would not be able to compost all of it, you would increase emissions by 49 times. So instead of like, it's really valuable to have cattle consuming those leftovers from our everyday, you know, products that we consume. Yeah, here in the Midwest, Tara mentioned distiller's grains, and that is a byproduct from ethanol. And so that's what one of the the byproducts we're able to feed. You know, I'm not really in cotton country here in Nebraska, so we're not feeding like the the cotton seeds that Tara's talking about, but we can take all of that, like Tara said, Distillers grains is going to go to waste. It's not going to be used anywhere else. Humans can't consume it. And actually a large part of cattle's diet is, I think it's over almost 90%. It's like 86% of what cattle consume is inedible by humans. And so that's what's really awesome about cattle too, is that they're taking all of these things that we cannot consume that would go to waste, you know, grass, all these byproducts, and then they're turning them into these really high quality proteins that we can eat. So it's a pretty cool cycle when you get into like cattle's diet and what they're doing for the environment in that aspect. Is every farm doing this or is this only for conscious individuals who are wanting to use byproducts? If they're not, is it just because of laziness or inaccessibility? Are there issues with this or not really? No, I would I would say across the board, farmers are doing this. Farmers are very resourceful. It also makes sense, right? Like so that those cotton farmers down the road from us are looking for, you know, a place to be able to sell that cotton seed. So it makes sense for us to be able to buy it. We can probably get it at a little bit better price than maybe a different feed just because it is a quote unquote byproduct and doesn't have a lot of other sources or uses. And so it is kind of that like circular system of that, like every farmer is trying to like reduce their waste on their farm somehow. And so you're able, I mean, it's the same as we sell our, you know, we compost all of the manure on our dairy out of our pens and we ultimately sell it to farmers to then naturally fertilize their soils. My husband always jokes that for every feed truck that we bring in to feed our cows, he hopes that we have a truck of manure leaving our farm to go back to that field to then, you know, refill the nutrients in those soils, that it is that circular loop. And so I think it's really across the board. And I mean, there's so many instances of it. We have peanuts in our town. And so we use peanut holes, the shells of peanuts for bedding for our calves. Again, it would 
be a waste product. There's not a lot you can do with peanut shells. And we use it and we love it. The calves love it. And so it's thinking about all of those different pieces and components and how you can make them work in your you know, local area. And would this also be kind of leading into the conversation around regenerative versus traditional or conventional agriculture? Or is that something separate? Can you kind of go into, because these are, you know, buzzwords that we hear. Can you go into how that's different or how the byproducts and upcycling kind of feed into that system? I would say it's not. I mean, there are probably regenerative farmers that are doing that, but it's definitely a practice done by conventional farmers too. Like Tara said, it's across the board. I, you'd be really hard pressed, I think, to find someone. Obviously, if it's completely 100% grass fed cattle, like when we're speaking beef, then they're not going to be, you know, using any of those byproducts because they're just, you know, working with grass completely for 100% of the diet. But other than that, I think you'd be really hard pressed to find a producer that isn't using some sort of byproduct in there processes because, yeah, I mean, that's just, it's very, very common to supplement cattle's diet with the grass and the bright products together. I'll jump in here. I kind of will add to that conversation. You know, one thing that I wanted to touch on is like our dairy farm, our milk goes ultimately into conventional milk. Like it's just the regular old milk that you buy on the shelf. Like that is what we sell to. And so I think that a lot of times when you look at regenerative ag, it's like on a spectrum. It's not necessarily like a yes or no, like check the box. It is like a spectrum of different management practices. And so it is from everything from composting to using byproducts to all of these different things. You know, Natalie can talk about what it, that looks like on a cattle ranch, but we're picking the different practices that work for our farm, our region to be more regenerative and that you're always working toward being more regenerative. It's not necessarily just like, okay, yep, I'm there. I did, I did all the things. It's like, how can I make it better every single year to get a little bit more regenerative? Yes, completely. Okay. So what I'm understanding is that it's more on a spectrum than just check the box. Now I'm a regenerative farm. Now we mentioned the grass fed piece and I know individuals listening are like, wait a minute, you feed your cattle, not grass. Can we kind of get into that as deep as you really want to go on the whole grass fed piece? And I'm sure it's different depending on dairy farmers and cattle kind of the differences there, but can we talk a little bit about the misconceptions and goals around grass-fed, if it's necessary or not, or kind of what your thoughts are there? Yeah, I'll try. I can kick it off with beef and I'll try and maybe keep it bigger picture. And then if you have like questions from it, we can kind of dive into it, but I don't want to lose people in, you know, like getting too into the weeds of things. You know, when you go to the grocery store to buy things or buy beef, there is the option to have, you know, what we think of as like, quote unquote, conventional beef, which people usually associate with like grain finished beef, they'll tie it to typically like feedlots, like there's kind of that, that image of, you know, the beef you're buying. And then there's the image of the, you know, quote unquote, regenerative 100% grass fed. I don't like to, I guess, put them in that far of camps. Because to me, I think what a lot of people do is they see that grass fed label and they associate it maybe with like animal welfare and it really has nothing to do with that. They maybe associate it with a nutritional claim and it really has nothing to do with that. What that label means is that the animal was just fed grass for the entire diet of their life. It is really just a diet claim for the animal. And it's really not as big of a difference between conventional diets as I think a lot of people shopping in the grocery store would think. So whether an animal is 100% grass-fed, grass-finished, or an animal is that quote-unquote conventional grain-finished animal, they are going to spend about 75% of their life, two-thirds of their life out on pasture, consuming grass, drinking milk from their mama. That is the way our beef supply chain is set up. That is the common practice that happens, you know, I don't want to say darn near the whole, you know, that is what you will get when it comes to the beginning life of a beef cow. Where they diverge is those last 120 to 200 days of their life. So it's, you know, a couple months, four to six months is the average where the grass-fed animal will continue to just consume grass. Again, that's the only thing they're getting in their diet. And the grain-finished animal will get those other things that we talked about. They'll get, you know, byproducts added in. They will get the corn added in. They'll get different grains and different supplement in addition to grass. And so that's really the big difference between them is just what the animal's eating. And it really comes down to the very few last months of their lives when that, that diet diverges. Yeah. And on the dairy side, we're also feeding grass in addition to all of the different things. Like grass is still a large component. So even though we're feeding the byproducts that we've talked a lot about, a big portion of it is still the grass and the hay. 
And actually, a nutritionist plans uh, most of our cattle's diets so that we make sure that we're getting a well-rounded like meal for them, even when we're adding in those you know different components. We're testing them to see what their nutrient content is, so that we can make sure we're you know getting all of their proteins, fats, micronutrients that they need. Seeds Daily Symbiotic is a broad-spectrum probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains for whole body benefits, including gut, skin, and heart health. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, I shared that by taking Seeds Symbiotic DSO-1, I have gone to the bathroom every single day. And for somebody who has struggled with constipation, and if you are one of these individuals, it is It is excruciatingly painful, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, like you just, oh, you know what I'm talking about if you've experienced this. Seeds Daily Symbiotic is engineered to survive digestion. Their patented capsule in capsule via cap technology optimizes viability and delivers a precision release to the colon. No refrigeration required, so you can travel with this thing. I started taking DSO-1 in my rotation, and I've continued taking it because it's helped me get a bowel movement every day since January 2023. Here are some of the additional benefits that you could expect from DSO-1. It reinforces healthy tight junctions in vitro. It supports healthy gut immune function and responses to occasional GI and environmental stressors. It encourages stability and diversity with the gut microbiota. It supports optimal gut bacteria levels, promotes a healthy microbiota environment in the gut, provides relief from occasional digestive discomfort, bloating, and intermittent constipation. Oh, this stuff can't live without it, you can go to seed.com slash KDP and use the code KDP to redeem 25% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com slash KDP and use the code KDP. So from a consumer perspective, when I go to the grocery store and I'm looking at a couple of options, depending on what grocery store I go to, obviously, sometimes they just only have the one option. And I see just a conventional meat, it's just ground beef. And then I see maybe grass fed package and then a grass fed grass finished package. What you're saying, Nat, is that it's more so you don't entirely know of the animal welfare between these three different packets. You don't know actually the nutrient content of any of these three packets. How is a consumer supposed to make the right decision if Specifically, the nutrient density is a big piece. And even the animal welfare for a lot of us, the reason why we are willing to spend more on our products is because we want to make sure the animals were treated fairly. So how, as a consumer, do we even know if we can't trust the grass-fed, grass-finished option necessarily? Yeah. So that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it because I do think there's a lot of people who stand in that situation and are just confused by our, you know, nation's food labels. And that is not just when it comes to meat. Tara and I could get on a whole soapbox about food labels and I think the harm they're starting to do to our food system instead of actually helping consumers understand what they're buying. I feel like they do add more confusion and questions. I always say... I want you to feel comfortable going into the grocery store and purchasing beef. My family's ranch, we feed into the conventional supply chain. So our calves will be bought by a feedlot and they will be turned into grocery store beef, food for restaurants. You know, they go down that conventional path. Um, we are not, you know, the a grass-fed operation. And a lot of people who follow me online always say, like, if we knew everyone across the nation was like your farm, we'd feel so much more better, you know? And I always say, I am not the exception. You know, I am the rule. Like our operation is going to be fairly similar to everyone else that is entering the beef supply conventionally. So I always say, if you're going into the grocery store, to me at the grocery store level, beef is beef. So, you know, you pick what you feel best, what you can afford for your budget. Like I said, those claims aren't going to help you know exactly where the animal come from, exactly how the animal was treated. All those things you may have like minute questions around, but still feel good about going in. If you are the person that wants those question answers and wants to know, you know, more of those nuanced details, don't rely on the labels. Find a local farmer and rancher or order online now. There are so many farmers and ranchers that actually ship nationwide. So if you feel like you can't even find one in your area, I guarantee if you got on the internet and typed in, you know, like ranch direct beef, you would have a plethora of websites that would ship to you. 
That way you will know. You will be able to follow this, probably the ranch on social media. Most of those people that are doing ranch direct consumer beef businesses are sharing online because that's how they're getting their customers. So you'd be able to follow them. You would know the name of the rancher. You would see the animals. Like you would have that connection you're craving that you can't get from the grocery store. So again, don't feel bad about going into the grocery store. I stand behind the beef in the grocery store. But if you are the type of person that wants those questions answered, I wouldn't pay the five extra dollars for the grass-fed label in the grocery store. I would pay the extra money to try and support a local farmer or rancher. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is it's all about connections. If you want to know, then you got to know your farmer and you got to know all the details about them. And you're right. There are so many really, really great farms online and you can follow them and learn all about their practices. So I totally agree with you on that. Anything to add, Tara, from a dairy perspective with the different types of qualities of things? Yeah. So, you know, everyone, I always get asked, you know, about conventional versus organic and all of those different things. And really what it comes down to is Natalie kind of alluded to this. I mean, it's different farming practices. It's not necessarily like animal welfare or like safety or nutrition. Like the nutritional composition of organic milk versus conventional is very, very similar. It's about, you know, on-farm practices and kind of what is actually happening as far as whether cattle are grazing or not. But I mentioned, I mean, my milk goes to conventional milk. And so I feel like people, again, should feel really good about being able to purchase whatever milk is in within their budget and within, you know, what their like morals and values are of what they want to like put their money behind. And I think that really comes down to the conversation, like going off of what Natalie said, we both heard a quote one time from a woman who said, tell me what you care about and I'll tell you what product to buy. Like there is not a single product that like does everything. They all are like different things that they put like value in and that that's what you're paying for. And so I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer when choosing any of the the meats or the dairy at the grocery store. It really comes down to like what you care about and like what you want to put your money behind. And so I think that is like such a good approach. Like there, it's there's no like right or wrong and there's no like unsafe or safe. Like our food is very safe. It's you choosing which products like make sense for your family. So in this safe versus unsafe and conversation around dairy, can we touch on raw milk versus conventional milk? Because I feel like this is exploding on TikTok right now and everyone's angry at everyone. So can we just go into a little bit around this conversation? Yes, I feel like this is everywhere right now. I just was having a conversation at a conference on Wednesday with someone about raw milk and this whole debate. So I actually spend the majority of my life consuming raw milk all through my childhood. I obviously live on a dairy. It is very simple to be able to go and just get milk. It's kind of just a part of your life when you're on the dairy. You don't really think anything of it. In my adult life, I actually chose to, after I got pregnant with my oldest daughter, decided to go to conventional, just store-bought, pasteurized, homogenized. And so that is the difference. Raw milk is not pasteurized or homogenized. And pasteurization and homogenization are two different things. Pasteurization is like where you heat the milk up for about two seconds to eliminate any like bad bacteria that may be in there or something like that. It makes the product more safe. It's essentially like cooking your steak. That is what you're doing homogenization is a little bit different. It's where they actually like break up the components of milk so that the cream doesn't settle on top. So if you've ever had non-homogenized milk, the cream settles on top and you've got to shake the milk before you drink it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with heavy cream on top and skimmed milk on the bottom, right? Like you're, it's going to be two different types of milk. So I don't think it's similar. I think that this comes down to choices. I do think if you choose raw milk, you do have to accept the risk that is associated with raw milk it would just be like eating raw sushi, right? Like there is a risk that you could, you know, get a foodborne illness. Same if you eat really, really raw steak, like it's very similar. And so there is some risk. It's not like astronomical, but there is risk associated with it. I personally don't believe in like the health benefits of like raw milk over conventional or pasteurized milk. I think they both are nutrient powerhouses that offer a ton of nutrient dense food in a very small, convenient package for people to be able to take. So we can kind of, if you have more questions in there, but that's kind of like an overview, I guess, of raw milk. I think similar to the beef side, if you choose raw milk, I recommend really knowing your dairy farmer, knowing what their practices are, you know, how are they cleaning their bottles, how all of those things are really important questions to be asking. Are they testing every single, you know, tanker of milk before bottling it? Like what all is going into it, I think are important things for people to ask when they choose the raw milk option. 
Yes, it's like the responsibility of a sushi bar. I walked by a grocery store yesterday, actually, and they said five dollar sushi, and I'm like, that is sounds not like a bad sushi. idea. <laughs> yeah, a bad idea. <laughs> no, it is, and that was actually the conversation on Wednesday that I was having with someone. It was talking about food safety, and it's like people want the food to be safer, and they want it to be like no risk associated with your food. And I think that's where we ended up in a world where they we've like outlawed raw milk. We've like you know put a lot of regulations in place. And now people are wanting to make that decision for themselves. But if you're making that decision for yourself, you need to be very conscious of the decision you're making it. And it's not like raw milk. I mean, like I drink it my whole life and never got like I've never had a foodborne illness from it. But it's still something you've got to consider. Yes, don't buy the $5 sushi at the grocery store in the lukewarm refrigerator. It's the same exact thing. Yes, completely. So Let's talk a little bit more about the consumer side of things and what these things mean when we're shopping at the grocery store and thinking about milk. Because really, when we want to kind of get to when the rubber meets the road, what tools do we have in order to make safe choices for our family and really understand, you know, what both of you have said is whatever your goal is, there's a product for that, but you need to understand the resources and just have more details probably. So I think it was Natalie that talked about the food labels. I am happy for you to jump on that that box and, and go for it of just what are you seeing when it comes to consumers and the decisions they're making and the labeling and what are you seeing overall and what's really grinding your gears on that? Yeah, I think we as a society, when we're shopping, Uh, rely too heavily on food labels without the understanding that food labels have turned into, in my personal opinion, basically a marketing tool now for, you know, food products. I don't think they're there to, you know, really give you the information and transparency you crave. Like even sometimes grass fed on a, you know, beef can mean something different than grass finished and all natural actually isn't even regulated. So I mean, there are a lot of labels out there that don't even mean anything. People are just, you know, manufacturers are just putting them on there to kind of, we call it greenwashing. And a lot of people call it greenwashing. You can hear that in a lot of other industries. And I think they're starting to bring it over to the food industry. And so I just always encourage people to not rely solely on the labels. You know, Tara and I are big advocates for like a whole food diet. So we're not like, you know, carnivore. We're not like, you only need to eat meat. Meat's the best thing. Like that's all you should be consuming. I mean, we're not on the other end of the spectrum where we're like, you know, obviously plants are the only thing that our diet should be composed of. I think we're actually like fall right in the middle. Tara and I, she actually eats a little bit more protein than I do, or maybe I should say a little less vegetables than I do. <laughs> Better way to say it. <laughs> yeah, we kind of fall right in the middle. I mean, we're just advocates for like a whole food diet. And then outside of that, I just, I just, I want people to have like a healthy relationship with food. And I just don't think relying on labels and shopping solely based off labels is going to like, I guess, feed into that or accomplish that. Yeah, I think on the dairy side, I'll use, you know, like a couple examples on the label side. I remember I picked up a gallon of milk a few years ago and it said gluten free. And I went to our dairy processors and was like, are you kidding me? And they said, if we don't put it on there right now in this day and age, and this was a few years ago, I feel like where the gluten craze was even more like it was just starting and kicking off. They said people have put like we've done research. Consumers won't buy it because they like they don't necessarily people are just looking for that label. And even like the RBST conversation, like I've been asked so much about like, what is RBST? You know, I see RBST free on the milk label. Fun fact, no milk on the shelf, no fluid milk on the shelf is from cows treated with RBST. It is not being used in the United States. And it is still an ongoing issue. I see it online all the time. I get asked about it all the time. And so those kind of labels, you know, people want to see like the RBST free Otherwise, it concerns them that it's there when in reality, it's not anywhere. And so it's just very complicated. And so I do think that's where it goes. Like, I think that our goal with Discover Ag, like our podcast is to make sure that people, when they walk into the grocery store, they feel confident about the products they're choosing and they're not afraid. I feel like there's a ton of like fear, guilt, shame associated right now with our different food choices. And I think we have to get away from that. It has to be more of a conversation where, you know, you know, walking in the grocery store, you feel confident with your food buying decisions. And I'll kind of bring up a big one that I'm sure whoever's listening right now is thinking about. And I don't know how far we'll go down this hole, but organic obviously is like a very big label in the grocery stores right now. And again, that is actually just on farm practices. So that is not going to be like a nutrient label And I think a lot of people will feel like they have to purchase the one that has organic on it or that maybe even things within the center of the grocery store, like the organic granola bar is going to be better than buying, you know, the conventional beef. And in my opinion, that can be further from the truth. Like if I had an option between 
buying the organic granola bar and then the conventional grocery store beef that was like the cheapest beef there, I would buy the beef. I'd buy the animal protein every single time. And, you know, it's going to be way more nutrient dense. And so I just don't think labels are doing a service to us anymore. And I think they've actually kind of brainwashed and confused us about what we should be putting in our grocery cart ultimately. Yes, completely. I think the marketing, I'll never forget. I was at Expo West, which is an event that they do once a year on the West Coast, really introducing buyers and sellers to new products that are on the market. And I took my sister this one time, and this was the year that Boom Chicka Pop came out with their popcorn. So it was a big deal. And I sat across from the marketing director and she was talking to some individuals and she said, the difference between our popcorn and other popcorns is that it has whole grain energy. And my sister and I looked at her like, whole grain energy, what? what do you mean? It's popcorn. Like (laughs) all popcorn is popcorn. There's no different energy that you're going to get from one popcorn versus the other popcorn. Or even if you look at the grocery store on coconut oil now, they'll say keto friendly. It's like, well, I mean, it's oil. Like, of course, of course it's keto friendly. So, and I think on the flip side of that too, if you go to Costco, keto is really big in Costco and has been for a couple of years. And a lot of products, which I generally wouldn't recommend on a ketogenic diet are saying keto friendly. So I think it goes both ways of like, sometimes it's like, well, duh, of course, you know, in the case of the RBST, you were saying, well, it's nowhere. So why is it on the label? And then on the flip side, it's, this should not necessarily be labeled this way because it's, it's deceitful in a lot of ways. And that's that marketing tool. I think that you were talking about Natalie, just using those pieces. And not to keep like, you know, driving this home, but hopefully, you know, people listening are kind of this is where a lot of their questions are. But like Tara said, unfortunately, you have to play the game, right? Like we've talked to a lot of direct to consumer beef ranchers that say if we don't put on the no antibiotics, then people won't. They'll think we have antibiotics in our beef. And Tara and I have talked about this on our podcast several times. There are withdrawal periods like you will not get beef at the the grocery store. You will not be able to buy it with antibiotics in it. It's the same thing with chicken when they put no added hormones. Like they've outlawed that for I don't even know how long. And still you'll see that on chicken all the time. And so it's unfortunate for people who are like maybe the direct to consumers that are trying to market themselves and do feel like they have to use those labels because it's kind of like feeding into that, you know, terrible place we're at. But like Tara said, sometimes we look for those labels because we just don't know otherwise. And we do want to feel like we're putting a safe product in ourselves. So I understand why we would seek them out. I just encourage people to listening to maybe not like take the label for like, you know, the sole reason to purchase one over the other. Yes, completely. Let's talk about the symptoms of hypochlorhydria, also known as low stomach acid. Abdominal pain, bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, undigested food in your stool, acid reflux, heartburn, sound familiar? Out of all of the patterns I see in my clients' hair tissue mineral analysis and even in their blood work, low stomach acid is a huge issue. What helps stomach acid? Sodium. If you're on a ketogenic diet, chances are you are not consuming enough sodium. Now, sodium is the body's great solvent. It's a primary alkalizer and it influences stomach acid levels. If you're dealing with allergies, abdominal bloating, depression, dizziness, fatigue, low blood pressure, poor protein digestion, like you eat some protein and it just feels like it sits in your stomach, even weakness can be because you don't have enough sodium. Now, my favorite way to boost my sodium on a daily basis is to take at least three packets of Element electrolytes per day. That's a little bit hardcore for most people, but I tend to be a little bit more adrenal deficient. And so taking these electrolytes while I'm eating a low carb or even as deep as a ketogenic diet just takes things to the next level. I've been using Element here for over two years, and I can say they are the best electrolyte powder, hands down. If you've never tried Element, or maybe you just haven't found the right flavor for you, you're in luck. My friends over at Element put together a really sweet offer for us. Right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any order. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share them with a friend that's maybe on the fence about joining your electrolyte party. Get yours by going to drinklmnt.com slash KDP. This deal is only available through my link. So you must go to drinklmnt.com slash KDP. Element offers a no questions asked refund also. It's totally risk-free. So if you don't like it, 
share it with a friend and get your money back. No questions asked. Again, that's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash K-D-P. And I think on the organic side of things, I totally agree with you. Totally comes down to farm practices. Where I've noticed being a real benefit to organic is the glyphosate. Do you guys know enough about glyphosate to really comment on that? Do you guys, are you exposed to it in your spaces at all? So I feel like we are not experts enough to comment on that. I will admit we are not row crop farmers, either of us. And so it's just not something that is like super in our wheelhouse. But I will say, like being conventional, we obviously, you know, on our farm, we do feed, you know, GMO crops to our cattle. And so that is a difference. Like if you are a person who does not believe in GMOs, then an organic option that they are not fed, you know, cattle are not fed with GMO crops. And that is something that is exactly a perfect example of when I was saying, like, if that's something that matters to you, then an organic would be a great option for you. You know, the pesticide part of the conversation is a little different. So like you mentioned glyphosate specifically, I totally just butchered that name. <laughs> You're fine. Glyphosate, but... <laughs> glyphosate. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay, I'm moving on from it. You know, organic is able to use pesticides too. They just have to be non-synthetic pesticides. So I even think sometimes that conversation around organic gets lost. Like people think organic means something that it doesn't. They think it means like absolutely like no quote unquote chemicals when in reality, it's more about like how you're farming and which of the products you're able to use or not use. And so I do definitely encourage people, you know, if you're choosing to spend the extra money, I mean, just last week on the podcast, we covered about organic and the price increase of organic. And our conversation wasn't necessarily pro or against, but if you're going to spend that extra buck, make sure you know what that buck is going towards, basically. Yeah, that was actually a really interesting article because they were, like Tara said, talking about the price increase and whether... Because it's getting, it's quite a bit large difference. Like when they gave some examples of the differences between, and the article also interviewed a registered dietitian and kind of got her thoughts on it too. So it was a really interesting article to cover um, on our podcast last week. I love that. Yeah, I think this conversation, really some of my takeaways so far is connecting to individuals to see whether or not you can purchase their food just direct if certain things speak to you. I think just being educated, being in this space for so long, 15 years, it was quite recent that I learned about glyphosate and some of the issues around glyphosate. And I was like, wait, I think I, I should care about this. Like with my history of liver issues and just where I'm at with my health, it's one of the things where I pay attention and I'm willing to spend more. But you're right, it might not be somebody else's goal. And I think the worst thing we can do, not only for our budgets or even for our time and the limited time that we do have is spend time, energy and money on things that we don't really know what they're doing, but we think that they're the best for us because somebody said so. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing you'll hear Tara and I like repeatedly say is that we stand for food choice. Like our whole mission, I guess, isn't to tell you exactly what to buy. It's to like help you better understand and connect so that you can make those informed decisions for yourself and feel like you are doing the best service for yourself and your family. So we'll never be like, here's the checklist of what you should exactly buy. And here's the reasons why. But we'll, what we do is like kind of dive into topics and have discussions. So people will be like, Oh, that's what that means. And like you said, Oh, that's why I should care about it. Or Oh, never mind, I don't need to care about it. Because that's really what our society needs more of. We don't need more people telling us like what to do. We need more people like kind of peel back and like inviting them into our world and saying like, this is what we do on our farm. And this is what it means for you when you're ultimately buying it as a consumer. Well, and I think it's extremely irresponsible of, you know, people to assume, you know, someone's entire life, like your medical history. What are their kids, you know, eating habits? Are they allergic to things or what you just can't, what do their budgets consist of? And so I just think it's irresponsible to say like, quote unquote, you have to eat this certain way. When in reality, like, I mean, Natalie talked about, I have been, I consume a lot, probably a lot less vegetables than Natalie. I don't feel great when I sit down and eat a salad. Like that's, and that is my like metabolism. And I've been, I feel like for years I was telling myself, I have to eat more vegetables. I have to eat more vegetables. And in the last six months, I've been like, I don't feel great. So I'd rather eat more fruit. So how can I incorporate more fruit into my diet? And that is literally just me listening to my like body and what my intuition is telling me and then doing research and then going out and finding more information. And so I just don't think we can tell any one person like this is absolutely what will work for you or this is not what will work for you. Yes, completely. I think the issue and we talked about this a little bit ago too is 
if we have the education, we know what to look for, we know what's important to us. There are companies, and I've come across a couple of them, specifically meat companies and butchers, and that there's been so many issues over the last couple of years of companies saying they do certain things, and then they don't do those certain things. And a year goes by, and then all of a sudden there are lawsuits and all the things, and you have to change everything. What has been your experience? Have you had experiences with this of just the companies themselves or the ranchers themselves being dishonest? Well, I will say that I am pretty lucky because I eat my own beef. (laughs) So (laughs) I know exactly what the rancher is saying and doing. (laughs) And, you know, I grew up that way. I grew up with two freezers in our garage full of, you know, harvesting animals we raised on our, our, you know, our own operation. And so it was something I definitely took for granted. And I know a lot of people listening are like, oh, you know, I wish you know, we had that ability to do that. And so I do feel very fortunate that I get to to process our own animals and so connected that I married the rancher. So it's a pretty close connection. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, no, I feel like I don't, I can't think of an instance where I really ran into that. I can think of a few times there's been a couple of lawsuits with different things. And I will say one thing with like the lawsuits, it's not always the way it seems either when it gets painted in like the media. Like sometimes the some of the lawsuits I've had like that I've seen and I've had some like insider information. I'm like, that is not being portrayed in the media exactly how it went down. You know, sometimes for some companies, it is simple. It is less expensive to just settle and say, fine, we did it wrong, even if there was maybe more to the story. And so I do think that is really hard and challenging. But I think the more like if you are buying your beef from a direct consumer where you are following them on social media, you're sending emails with them. Like, I just don't know that you can get much more connected with someone than that. Like in this day and age, I think that well, is marriage. really yeah, yeah. yeah marriage. <laughs> Unless you want to marry a dairy farmer, a cattle rancher and move to the middle of nowhere in New Mexico, Nebraska. I feel like I can safely say like if you are ordering from a direct to consumer beef, like you're ordering from a family, a family farm, and they're doing absolutely the best they can to provide high quality beef. It's probably the beef they're serving to your kids. And I feel like there's anything I know about ag is if an ag family is serving it on their table, it is a darn good product and you can feel good about it. Yes. I love that. I love that answer. I want to spend the rest of our time together kind of going through some listener questions. I think some of this some has some misconceptions in it. Other items perhaps we've already covered already, but it will just be a good summary piece because they were pretty consistent questions across the board over and over and over again. So I know that they're pretty important for individuals. So the first one was, when they put hormones in animals, is it injected or do they put it in the food supply? Oh, it would not be put into the food supply. I feel like we can only probably speak to beef and dairy. There is not any added hormones added to any food. So I feel like in the milk space, we hear a lot about like hormones in milk. There are naturally occurring hormones in every food you buy, even vegetables, like every single food. And actually, there's a lot of hormones, naturally occurring hormones in vegetables more than people think. And so nobody is adding hormones to your food system. They're like beef is just beef. It's a single cut of beef and milk. The only ingredient in milk is milk. Sometimes there's milk with added vitamin D so you can absorb the calcium a little bit better, but that says it on the label. So there's, yeah, nothing being added. Great. Okay. What does grass-fed meat versus grass-fed finished mean? We kind of covered that, but just the basis of if I see a label and it says grass-fed and then I see a label and says grass-fed, grass-finished, what am I seeing the differences of? Well, I think the USDA is maybe looking into changing this, but previously grass-fed could be put on grain-finished animals because they were still consuming grass like I talked about. So they are theoretically like a grass-fed animal. That's why you need to, if you do want to buy grass, like you want the only thing the animal ate to be grass, Look for the grass finished label because that is USDA regulated, actually, the, the finished portion. And that would mean that they didn't get that, you know, last part of their life, those other products that I talked about. They just continued to get grass. And we touched a little bit on budget. Perhaps we can go a little bit deeper into this. There were a lot of questions around how do I make sure that I'm eating good quality animal products, but I'm on a tight budget? Do you have any tips around that? Yeah, I feel like if you are on a budget, I hope you leave this conversation knowing you can feel safe about the conventional products at the grocery store. So I pick up, I am a dairy farmer. I know exactly what goes into producing milk. I pick up the cheapest gallon of milk on the shelf and that is what I serve my family. And I feel really, really confident in that decision. And then I think, you know, on the meat side that, you know, 
we butcher our own cattle as well. We actually butcher our dairy cattle for beef. And you end up, when you butcher your own cow, you end up with a lot of ground beef. And I feel like ba- ground beef sometimes gets a bad rap, but I use ground beef in so many different foods and it is such a great way and an inexpensive way to be able to add animal protein, you know, from everything from your spaghetti sauce to, you know, your chili or going into fall. Like I just try to sprinkle that ground beef everywhere to be able, first of all, to use it up because I end up with a lot of it in my freezer, but also just because it is a quick, easy, affordable food. And I know then, you know, it's easy for kids to consume. So those are some of the things that I do personally. And chicken. So I don't know if you guys will be able to answer this. Maybe you will. We'll just roll with it. The bleach bath. Do you know about the bleach bath? What are your thoughts in the bleach bath? Can you get chicken that hasn't been bathed in bleach? Is it being bathed in bleach? Do you know? You are like asking the two wrong people about chicken. I can't remember the last time I ate chicken, let alone cooked it, actually. I have recently, we've been getting direct to consumer chicken from a company. And so I have been incorporating more chicken into my diet, but I unfortunately do not know. And that is one of the things about ag. We kind of started this conversation there that like, you know, I know very little about like the poultry and hogs side of agriculture because it's just not something we're exposed to at all on the cattle side. You know, I feel like beef and dairy have somewhat overlapped because we have, you know, a cattle animal, but yeah, very little exposure to poultry and hogs. I have seen that. I'm guessing the person got that question from the reel and TikTok that is going around and it has been on my list to actually look into and maybe we'll cover it on the podcast. But like Tara said, yeah, I have never even seen, you know, chicken production in real life. I've never toured one, unfortunately. So I cannot speak to the processes that like chicken goes through from, you know, start to finish. Yeah, I know when I purchase direct to farmer, sometimes when I run out because I've just had too much meat, well, is there such a thing as too much meat in a month? (laughs) I don't think so. With you, Tara, like I will eat all the meats. But sometimes when I run out, I end up just having to go to the grocery store and get some chicken. And I notice a certain smell that's just not in the stuff that I get direct from the farmer. So I don't know what that is. I've never really dug deep into it. I've had other people on the podcast talk about the bleach bath and say that they'd been in like plants and things like that where they were doing it and butchers who were doing it, but I haven't really delved deep into that piece either. A common thing that's happening, there's a couple of companies that do this. They get their meats from other countries. Do you guys have thoughts around getting meats from other countries? Should we stick to the US or not? Or what are the facts so that we can make the proper decision when it comes to different countries and getting our meat from other places? So I wish we could answer this quickly. Hopefully it won't take too long, but there is a lot to this conversation. Two portions, and we talked about this on our podcast too, but one of the things that goes into this again is labeling. Actually, the way the US the food system is set up right now is beef and pork is not regulated. It's called COOL, so country of origin labeling. We don't have that. It doesn't apply to beef and pork right now. So what that means is as long as the animal was harvested here in the U.S., they can have like the U.S. product label on it and be animals that could be, an, you know, an animal from Canada, it could be an animal from Mexico. It, could, it is not necessarily U.S. beef. And so that is definitely a hot topic in the beef industry. There are a lot of people advocating to change that. They have been trying to change that for years. And so it, it is a, a big deal. The other thing, again, going back to labels, a lot of the grass finished actually grocery store beef does come from like New Zealand and Australia. We import, um, it's over like 90% of our grass fed beef in the grocery stores because the US is just not set up to have that grass finished basis. So again, circling back to something we said at the very, very beginning, you know, tell me what you care about. If you want to care about the life cycle and the footprint of what it takes to get an animal shipped and raised from Australia to the US, and you feel like that is something that you don't want to support and you'd rather support a US farmer and rancher, then don't buy the grass-fed grocery store beef. Buy the grass-fed, you know, from a, a rancher directly or buy the conventional beef because the maybe the footprint of that is going to be less or different than what it would take to import that animal. And so, again, you get to pick and choose what is most important to you and where to put that money. But again, that's one of those confusing things that like grass finished in a grocery store means you're not supporting US, really. You're supporting, you know, across season. Maybe for someone that's really offensive and that's something they don't want to do. And maybe for someone else, they're like, I just want my grass-finished beef. So I'm going to pay for it and I'm going to import it, you know? Yes, completely. Is there anything you feel like we miss in this conversation that you want to delve into a little bit or any clinical pearls and pieces that you feel like could be beneficial to this conversation that maybe I missed because you guys are the pros? We covered a lot of ground today and talked about a lot of different topics. I'm actually really happy with where this conversation like floats. I don't know if there's anything in particular 
But, you know, we mentioned our podcast several times. I mean, this is what we do every week is whatever is trending in the news around food and agriculture. It's not just ag. Sometimes it's about food. We cover the top three trending news articles on Discover Ag Podcast. And so we get into these nuanced conversations where, you know, when you have 45 minutes to, you know, cover a lot of different things, you can't dive as deep in. But we really try to dive in on the podcast and give, you know, both sides of the conversation and come at it from, you know, the the lens of food choice in the end and people being informed about their food choices. Yeah, something I've been impressed with with just our conversation is your openness and the education piece of things because you're right, so many people are coming from different places and everyone has a different goal in mind. And so listening to content where you're not being pushed in a certain direction is always really important to me. And I know individuals listening to the Keto Diet podcast have heard that time and time and time again. So it sounds and just our conversation today really of just, we're not really sure of where you're coming from, but here are some thoughts so that you can make the right decision, I think is such a solid way of educating individuals. So thanks so much for taking that stance. And I know that it will serve you for many, many years and will also all your listeners as well. So thanks. Thanks for doing what you do, ladies. Thank Thank you. you. We love the podcasting space. We love having these conversations. We obviously love food and farming with emphasis on food. We love we're foodie girls. So it's always fun to, you know, connect with other communities and get to share. And yeah, it, it was a ton of fun today. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thanks for letting us share with your audience. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation with Natalie and Tara. Again, if you enjoyed this and you want to learn more from them, check out the Discover AG podcast. You can find it by going to podpage.com slash discover dash AG, or just go to Google and type in Discover AG podcast and a bunch of things will pop up. I'm sure you can even find them on your favorite podcast player. That's it for another episode. We will see you back here next Tuesday. Bye. Thanks for listening. Join us next Tuesday for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Looking for more resources? Go to healthfulpursuit.com for keto meal plans, weight loss programs, low carb recipes, and oodles of free resources to get you going. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 